Good day, everybody. And once again, we are back together. All right. So today we are going to be looking at the chemistry paper um, for the May June exam, uh, the 2024 exam. So please, if you haven't subscribed, do the right thing. And of course, your favorite uncle will always uh, give you some great content in maths and science. And of course, if you want to get in touch with us, all our details are on the description of this video. And you can come through to our center as well, where you can get assistance with maths and science, particularly for those of you that are upgrading. But uh, it's also available for anyone that is between uh, grade 8 and grade 12. All right, so let's get right into it. Okay, I'm going to start with the uh, multiple choice section in this question paper. Right, let's get started. So they say to us the functional group of aldehydes, right, uh, definitely in that case, that would be the formal ion, right? So we know that this would be the correct answer. A is the correct answer, right? So they say which one of the following equations represents the reaction for the identification of an unsaturated organic compound in the laboratory? Right, so remember, any time that you want to identify whether an organic compound is uh, saturated on, or unsaturated, you take it through a bromination test, right? So in this case, uh, we wanted uh, to find out, they said which one represents the reaction for the identification of an unsaturated hydrocarbon, right? Uh, in this case, organic compound. So the one that is unsaturated there uh, would be C, and we are taking C through a bromination test, and we know that it will therefore become saturated, right? So that would be C, and uh, that's the uh, most correct answer there, okay? But um, of course, you could also uh, test. Uh, in this case, you could use C, I mean D rather, uh, to test, and you'd find out that D would not react readily with bromine, and so, which means that um, B, and I mean D, option D is actually a saturated hydrocarbon. Okay, so let's go to the next one. They say, which one of the following is an empirical formula for ethyl ethanoate? So first of all, there's a difference between a molecular formula. So ethyl ethanoate, that means two carbons, two carbons, right? So this is an ester, so we'd have four carbons. And of course, for an ester, we know that the number of hydrogens is twice the number of carbons. So this would be C4H8, and we know it would be O2, right? Now, this is a molecular formula. But when we are doing or when we're trying to find an empirical formula, it means that we must actually have these ratios, right, as basic as possible. So we're going to divide by the smallest number, which is 2. Right, so if I divide that by two, that by two, and that by two, I will get C two, H four, and O. So that is the empirical formula. So remember, there's a difference between the two. So as a result, it means our correct answer there should be A. Right. So let's go right into the next one. They say in an experiment, we've got five grams of uh, calcium carbonate. Uh, that reacts with excess hydrochloric acid at a temperature of 40 degrees. Now they say uh, the volume of carbon dioxide produced versus time is shown in Kev P, right? So this would be the solid graph would be the graph that we get. Now they say the experiment is repeated with 10 grams now of the same calcium carbonate, okay, sample and excess hydrochloric acid with the same concentration at 40 degrees Celsius. So they say which one of the curves will now be obtained. Now, first of all, ladies and gents, it means that if we've got more calcium carbonate, right, we will get a greater or a bigger volume of carbon dioxide. So definitely we are looking at between uh, three and four, right? But now in this case, because we've got more, um, you know, uh, as much as it is a solid, I am expecting that the rate of reaction should be slightly more than the first rate of reaction. 
So as a result, I will choose option four, right? So in this case, I'll choose that as my option. Uh, bigger volume of carbon dioxide as well as just a slight adjustment in that rate of reaction. So as a result, I'll say D is the correct answer. Okay, so uh, let's go to the next one. They say the balanced equation okay, uh, below represents a reaction at equilibrium, right? They say which statement is or are true when a drop of concentrated hydrochloric acid uh, are added to the mixture. Now, first of all, ladies and gents, you need to always be mindful, right? When they're making the change, what exactly are they doing to the equation? So if I add a drop of hydrochloric acid, it means I am increasing the concentration of my hydronium ions, right? Now, according to Le Chatelier's principle, if I increase the concentration on the left, then the forward reaction is favored, right? So in this case, it means I'll see the solution turning more orange, right? And as a result, um, yeah, it will move from yellow to, to orange. Okay, so let's see. The options that are given, they say the reverse reaction is favored, um, will be favored. So that's not correct. We'll favor the forward reaction. Oh, by the way, they call this, we call this the common ion effect, right? So in this case, uh, the common ion was the hydronium ion in this case. And so number two, they say the concentration of uh, dichromate ions um, in this case would uh, increase, right? That would definitely be true. Okay, and they say the color of the solution changes from yellow to orange. That is also true. So that will be two and three. And that is option D, ladies and gents. So that is really what our answer will be. Right, now they say consider the equation below for a hypothetical reaction. So we've got A, uh, which is uh, aqueous, B, which is a solid. We already know this is not going to be in our uh, KC expression. And we've got C and D, which are both aqueous, right? Now they say the equilibrium constant. Now remember, ladies and gents, that for the equilibrium constant, we're going to include only um, substances that are in aqueous form, which is C, molar concentration of my products, right? That's C and D divided by the molar concentration of my reactants. Now, remember solids, okay, um, both solids and liquids have got a, uh, a constant uh, concentration, right? So that's why we never add them to a um uh, to the kc expression right because the um the concentration of a solid or a liquid is always constant so in this case this would be divided by the concentration of a right now in that case we see that that uh, um kc uh, is really less than um less than 1 okay so that is a proper fraction Okay, so what does it tell us? It tells us that the concentration of A must actually be greater than the concentration of both of these guys, right, uh, at the numerator. So if I look at that, definitely it's not going to be A and B because they include, uh, um, you know, they include B, the solid, right? So it would be, let's see, um, so the concentration of A should be greater than the concentration of C and D. So therefore, this would be our correct answer, which is C. Right, and then the next question, they say, which one of the following shows the product for the uh, reaction of oxalic acid with sodium hydroxide? So remember, uh, in this case, when you're taking oxalic acid, so we always know that we take a salt or we get a salt as well as uh, H2O, water, right? Uh, none of these okay. are actually carbonates, so we won't get carbon dioxide as a product. So the answer is definitely between. Uh, so if you, uh, if you look at that, uh, between B and C, but definitely it should be B because oxalic acid has got that weird... Um, you know, it's got this weird uh, reaction to it. 
okay, which is uh, uh, in this case COO, right? So uh, that is really how the cookie crumbles. They say four solutions of different acids in the same concentrations are compared, right? They say which one of the following Ka values represents the weakest acid at 25 degrees. Now, remember that the Ka value, that's the ionization constant of an acid. And the, the greater the ionization constant, the greater the, or rather the stronger the acid. So in this case, we're looking for the ionization constant that is uh, the lowest. Okay, so in this case, I would definitely say uh, it is A. Now, please be very careful because this says times 10 minus 6. So that means that it's got six zeros. Uh, before the actual number, right? So that's uh, 0 0.0006 times, uh, in this case, uh, 4, 5, right? So that is definitely A. So they say copper is purified by electrolysis, right? We want to know which one of the following combinations is correct for the changes occurring at the anode, the cathode, and the electrolyte when the cell is in operation. So they're telling us this is the anode, right? So please remember that at the anode, this is our positive electrode in an electrolytic cell. And the cathode would be the negative electrode. And so as a result, we're going to get in this case copper, right? Uh, copper 2 plus, right? Being uh, undergoing oxidation there. Right, so uh, actually copper undergoing oxidation and becoming copper 2 plus, right, at that anode. So the anode will definitely decrease in mass, okay? So the answer should be between B and D. But let's see, the cathode should increase in mass. That's definitely uh, the truth there. So copper 2 plus would actually gain electrons and become copper there. That's where purification actually takes place. And then remember that the electrolyte would remain constant. So there'll be no change in the electrolyte. The reason for that is that remember that the rate of oxidation and the rate of reduction uh, okay, uh, equally. So in this case, we know that the answer should be B. Okay, right. I hope that makes sense, guys. And then uh, the last one on this section, they say which one of the following redox reaction is spontaneous under standard conditions. Now, ladies and gents, please remember uh, what you would have to do for this is that we'd need to go to our standard reduction potential table and actually test. Um, the, you know, the easiest way to test is if uh, you use table 4B, right? When you use table 4B for a spontaneous reaction, it would actually create a C in a sense, right? So meaning, for instance, uh, if I were to take any of the reactions, I must find that uh, for Fe, Fe would be uh, Fe3 plus, I'm making an example with B, Fe3 plus should be uh, at the top and as a result, I minus must be at the bottom. Right. And in this case, this must undergo oxidation. Right. And this one must undergo reduction. So it forms a a, a, a C. Otherwise, you can just use my um, my rule. Uh, usually I use that uh, A and C rule. And in this case, uh, the correct answer, if you test it, you'll see that you will get uh, option B as the one that is spontaneous. All right, and now we're going to go into question two. And so we jump into question two. Um, so they give us there the letters A to H in the table, right, that represent eight organic compounds, right? Let's look at the questions that are asked there. They said define the term hydrocarbon. As I said in the first video, I'm not really going to bother much with the definitions. Uh, but remember that hydrocarbons are organic compounds that have uh, carbon and hydrogen only, right? So in this case, they said write down the letters for the two compounds that are unsaturated hydrocarbons. 
Now you note, um, I can definitely see unsaturated hydrocarbons would be either would either have double bonds and triple bonds, and that would definitely be um, uh, C as well as E. Uh, C is pen to one ion; it's got a triple bond there, and E has got a double bond. So in this case, we've got C and E that are represented there. And they say two compounds that are chain isomers of each other. Now remember, chain isomers in this case would have the same, I mean, um, would have the same functional group, but that is located in different positions in the parent chain. So I can definitely see that's going to be A and F, right? They are chain isomers of each other. They are both alcohols but the position of that uh, hydroxide ion is sitting at a different uh, position for each one of them. Right, and then they say a secondary alcohol. So remember the secondary alcohol would be A in this case because um, A has got the, uh, the hydroxide ion, right, sitting or rather having two other uh, carbons around it or rather the carbon that has the hydroxide ion has got two uh, hydrogens, uh, carbons rather, around it. Okay, so let's go to the next one. They say, write down the structural formula of the functional isomer of compound D. Now, if we look at compound D, right, this is definitely an aldehyde, right? And we know that aldehydes are functional isomers uh, of ketones, right? So which means we need to have a ketone which has one, two, three, four, five carbons, right? And so uh, in this case, it would be if we're going to draw that ketone. So first of all, it's going to have five carbons in it, right? We're going to have the double bond O in any other carbon except the one at the end. So in this case, this would be what it looks like. Okay, so we've got five carbons, right, and a double bond O. And nothing wrong if you chose to put the double bond O in carbon number three. That would still be a ketone. Um, yeah, and that is what it would look like. All right, so uh, they say to us uh, on the next one, we need to have the general formula of the homologa series to which compound B belongs. So if we look at compound B, right, um, compound B is actually an alkane. Uh, I'll show you what happens there. So you've got CH3, right, and you've got another carbon there. But this carbon has got methyl groups that are side chains. So CH3. And then we've got two of them, right? And then you've got uh, CH2, which means now these two are just uh, repeating, but they're part of the, uh, sorry, CH2 there. And the last one would be CH3. Now, if you look at that, the only way that uh, um, compound B or the only compound that it can be is a saturated compound it's got uh, side chains in it, so it is an alkane. So therefore, it must have the general formula CN H2N plus 2. Okay, right. And then they say to us the structural formula of compound C, right? Now, if I look at compound C in this case, they've got 3-ethyl and we've got pent one ion. So first of all, at carbon number one, we've got a triple bond, okay? And at carbon number three, we've got an ethyl group there. So let's try and see what it would look like. So uh, first, uh, by the way, uh, remember that you've got pent, which is five carbons. So I'd start there. So that's going to be five carbons in our parent chain. And we said between carbon number one and two, we'd have a triple bond there. And in this case, we know at carbon number three, we've got an ethyl. So therefore, there should be two carbons uh, with it over there. So 
this is what it would look like you can put in all the hydrogens that uh, should be in there please be very careful on the uh, triple bond right you must make sure that the, there are four bonds around each carbon so that one uh, is okay as is and you'd have hydrogens over there okay right so this is what um, a compound uh, C would look like in structural form. Right, and now let's go to the next one. They say write down the IUPAC name of compound E. Now, if we go to compound E, firstly, we need to identify which one is our parent chain. Remember that the parent chain must have all our carbons uh, or our double bonds rather, or and triple bonds, or uh, all our functional groups. So in this case, as, as I look at it, um, you can either choose to take the one on the left or the one on the right. It really doesn't matter. They look exactly the same, right? So if I note there, I see that I've got a, a, a side chain uh, with two carbons in it. So that's an ethyl, right? So uh, if I were to actually just uh, try to number this, I would say, well, this is carbon number one, two, this is carbon number three, and nothing wrong if you decided to number from left to right or right to left. So that would be five and six over there. And please note in this case, ladies and gents, that you've got at carbon number four, right we've got an ethyl group so that's where i'd start i'd say four ethyl okay and i've got six um carbons in my parent chain and as a result this would be hex right and at carbon number three i've got an in so this is going to be hex three in so that's the IUPAC name that I get there. All right, and uh, uh, in the next one, I'm going to have, um, uh, by the way, for that uh, side chain, could we get it to be closer? Um, yeah, actually we could. We could. Uh, by the way, uh, I, I think we, we could have actually numbered this from right to left. So if I say, Carbon number one, two, uh, three, four, uh, five, and six, actually. And now that I look at it, uh, we can actually number it like that. Okay, because then our double bond uh, will be at carbon number three, but so will our side chain. Remember, we must maintain a uh, uh, the smallest numbering system possible. So in this case, uh, this would be three ethyl. A hex 3 in all right instead of 4 all right so let's go to G all right so what would G be so first of all let's find out which uh, what is our longest chain in this case so uh, it looks like we're going to have this as our longest chain and so if I look at it ladies and gents um, we've got a side chain, right, at carbon number, okay, let's see where we're going to start numbering from. Um, again, it really wouldn't matter uh, for this compound. Okay, so this would be one, two, uh, we've got three, uh, four, five, and six. Right, so firstly, I can see that it's hex again. The longest chain would have six carbons. Now, I have got um, methyl groups in carbon number two and carbon number four, but I've got chlorine or chloros in this case at carbon number two and five, right? So this would be 2,5 dichloro. All right, so let's try and name it there. That's 2,5 dichloro. We've got, again, at carbon number, um, let's see, at carbon number 2 and at carbon number 4, 
so this would be 2 comma 4 dimethyl so this would be 2 comma 4 dimethyl please do not forget the hyphens all right and uh, the last thing there is that our parent chain has got six and they're all single bonds so that would be hexane all right uh, sorry about that so that would be hexane i'm just going to remove the other one right and then h the final one so we're looking for okay so firstly you can see that our parent chain has got that double bond c uh, h o so definitely an aldehyde but in this aldehyde we see that we've got um, side chains at carbon number two right so this is going to be two comma two dimethyl right so we've got methyls there so two comma two in fact uh, we don't even need to uh, number uh, in that case uh, so this would be dimethyl okay pro propanal right so this would be uh you can say 2 comma 2 dimethyl uh, propanal right and remember that for aldehydes you can only have the side chain i mean uh, the the functional group at the terminal carbon which is carbon number one and as i said ladies and gents there'd be absolutely nothing wrong because the only way you can have dimethyl could only be at carbon number uh, two so uh, if you call this dimethyl propanal i think this would be uh, absolutely correct all right and then the last one they say compound b undergoes combustion using molecular formulae write down a balanced uh, the balanced equation for this reaction right now let's look at compound b yet again we did conclude that it is a, a saturated hydrocarbon so it's an alkane uh, we said it's got seven um, uh, carbons in it okay so it if it's an alkane with seven carbons so remember alkanes c7 right now it would be two times seven right which is 14 plus two so this would be c7h16 plus oxygen which would give us um okay let's give some space there plus oxygens which would give us carbon dioxide plus h2o now what's left for us to do is to balance that reaction right i've got seven carbons there so that which means i'd have seven um on the right hand side 16 hydrogens so how do i make that 16 8 times 2 would would be 16 and now uh, if i see the number of oxygens that's seven times two which is 14 right plus eight times one which is eight those are all the oxygens and in this case if i have 14 plus eight that gives us uh, 22 right and in order to make that 22 that would have to be 11 right and this is how we balance that formula right so ladies and gents out of 22 marks we would have end us all the 22 there i hope you understood let's go to the next question and now going on to question three uh, they say the boiling points of some organic compounds are shown in the table below the atmosphere uh, atmospheric pressure rather is 101.3 kilopascals right uh, that's more accurate now they say first of all uh, define the term boiling point right uh, so please remember that boiling point is the temperature at which the vapor pressure of a, a liquid or a compound is equal to the atmospheric pressure all right now they say which one of the compounds a b and c is mainly in liquid phase at 100 degrees right now remember uh, in this case, if it is to be, or rather, if the boiling point of the compound, right, is more than 100 degrees, then it means that it would still be in liquid form 
uh, at that temperature. And the only one that we have there that would qualify is definitely compound C. Right, so they say explain the difference in boiling points uh, of compounds A and B. Now, if I look at them, both uh, they are haloalkanes. But if you look at compound A, it is a linear compound, which, me which means that it's got, uh, it doesn't have any side chains. And if you look at B, right, it's got a side chain. So remember that, uh, first of all, um, I'm just trying to look for space where I'm going to write. So compound A uh, is linear, okay, with greater surface area, right? So it's got greater surface area, uh, greater surface area. And B is more spherical. Okay, so it's more spherical with less surface area. Okay, and we must now uh, uh, relate surface area with um, the strength of intermolecular forces. So we know that uh, intermolecular forces increase uh, with an increase. So the strength of intermolecular forces increase with an increase in surface area. Okay. Um, in SA, right? And so more energy is required to emit or rather to uh, separate the molecules of A than that of B. All right, so please um, I mention all of that. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Let's go to the next one. They say consider the boiling point, uh, point boiling points rather below. Okay, uh, they say which one of these represent uh, X, the boiling point of compound D. Now, if you note compound D, this is an aldehyde. Okay, so definitely an aldehyde there. It's got that CHO. And remember that aldehydes have got dipole-dipole uh, forces, right? Well, in addition, obviously, to the London forces. And in this case, if you look at compound C, compound C is an alcohol. And uh, alcohols have got high... Um, uh, hydrogen bonds, right, uh, in addition to those um, London forces. So as a result, in this case, compound D should have a lower, um, you know, boiling point than compound C, right? So in that case, it would definitely be uh, 75 degrees, okay? So so let's, uh, which one of these? Okay, so that would definitely be 75 degrees. Now they said, explain the answer to question 3.4.1. Exactly what we said, right? So uh, we said compound C uh, has, right, hydrogen bonds uh, in addition Right, in addition to uh, our London forces, okay? So in addition to London forces, and we said compound D has got moderate, and by the way, uh, you need to, uh, to mention there, has got strong hydrogen bonds, right? In addition to London forces, while D has got moderate dipole-dipole um, uh, forces, Right, so in this case, in addition to those um, London forces, so these are moderate dipole dipole forces. So, definitely more energy is required to separate the molecules of D, uh, rather of C, than that of D. So, the boiling point of C must actually be lower than that of D. All right, and hopefully you can uh, finish up that statement, okay? But uh, yeah, I hope that you will be fine with that. Okay, so the next part, they say the atmospheric pressure is now changed to 83 kilopascals. Remember, by definition, boiling point is when uh, the vapor pressure, or it's the temperature at which 
uh, the vapor pressure of a compound is equal to atmospheric pressure. So once I change atmospheric pressure, automatically uh, the boiling point changes, right? So because they've decreased it, uh, so it means that the boiling point should also decrease. They say, how will the boiling points of organic compounds uh, be affected? Uh, choose increase, decrease, or remain the same. Uh, it would definitely uh, decrease in that case. Okay. Right. So uh, that is really how we are going to leave uh, that question. Let's go to question four. And on to question four now. They say in an experiment, a test tube contains methanol, propanoic acid, and a catalyst uh, that is heated uh, in a water bath, right? So they say write down the name of formula of the catalyst. So remember that the catalyst that we use, this is definitely uh, esterification. So we know it's going to be H2SO4, or you can say sulfuric acid. All right, so they say the type of reaction taking place. This is going to be esterification. Okay, uh, we know that uh, this is when we react an alcohol and an carboxylic acid. Now they say uh, two reasons why the use of a water bath is preferred uh, in this experiment. Okay, so first of all, um, remember that uh, alcohols are flammable, right? So um, alcohols are flammable, um, are flammable, okay? And so shouldn't be exposed to an open flame, right? And uh, the, second, uh, the, the second one is to um, obviously uh, increase the rate of the reaction, right? So those are the two reasons. Increase the rate of reaction. All right. And then they say the balanced equation for this re uh, reaction using structural formulae. Okay, so now we're taking methanol. So remember, in this case, we're going to have methanol. So we've got only one carbon. Okay, and we are reacting it with propanoic acid. So what I always prefer doing is that we've got propanoic, so that's double bond O with an OH. Okay, so let's write it like that. And so what we have, we're going to have this on, um, right, now what you need to keep in mind is that remember, we're going to form water. So what I always uh, kind of do is just take the H and the OH uh, on the one or the other, right? And what do we get as a product in that case? Uh, we know the H2O goes away. And so everything else we just simply are going to put together, right? Okay, I don't think I'm going to be able to fit all of that in one go. Okay, so that will be C. H3. Okay, so note that uh, we've got our O, which is in line with the carbons, and we've got our C with the double bond O. We've got our C and CH3 at the end. All right, so there, that is what we'd have as our final answer. But remember, we also have H2O, so we've got uh, plus H2O, and if you want to also Indi indicate rather that you've got H2SO4 as your acid catalyst over there. Right, so this is what uh, it looks like. And then finally, they say the IUPAC name of the organic compound for this reaction. So this is an ester. And remember, when whenever we are naming esters, we always start with the alcohol side first. So this is going to be methyl. Uh, propanoate, right? So remember that the suffix is O8. So propanoate. Um, this is what we have as our, uh, our ester. Okay, right. Now let's go to the next part of this. So they say compound A, a six carbon branch uh, haloalkane, is used in a two-step 
reaction to prepare compound C. So you can see that compound C there is a, uh, an alkane, uh, but it's a branched alkane in this case, right? So we're going to take from hello alkane to alkanes, all right? So, and we're going to follow two steps there. So in this case, we're going to have to eliminate this uh, halogen over here. So that's what we're going to do in step one. And then in step two, uh, I believe because they've said it's an addition reaction, it means we must have formed an alkene over there. And now for it to undergo the addition reaction, we're going to now have to uh, react it with hydrogen uh, in this case so that it becomes saturated. Right, so let's start with the first one. They say write down the formula or name of the inorganic reactant in reaction two. So please remember I said we went from alkene, right, to alkane. Okay, so that means that we must have added hydrogen. So the name uh, is hydrogen, or you can say the formula H2. Right, and they say the IUPAC name of compound B. So remember, we formed an, a haloalkane. Uh, I mean, from a haloalkane, rather, we formed an alkene. And all we added were hydrogens, right? So I'm going to assume that we must have had a double bond there, right, between carbon number one and carbon number two. So this would be uh, 3, 3. All right, so I'm going to say this is 3,3 dimethyl. And this is going to be, um, right, but 1 in. Okay, so at cover number 1 and 2, this is where we had the double bond, right? This is before we added the hydrogen. Right, and then they ask us on the next one, they say uh, the type of reaction represented by reaction one. So remember, we took from haloalkane and we formed an alkene there. So that should be an elimination reaction, right? So that is elimination. Okay, right. If yeah, you did want to uh, be more specific in that case. Uh, you, yeah, you, you could say uh, it's uh, dehydrohalogenation, uh, right? But uh, in this case, I think elimination should suffice. So they say reaction four is a substitution reaction, right? So compound B in this case, uh, remember, this is where we started with our uh, reaction B, which is an alkene. Okay, and remember now, so they're telling us that reaction four, rather, uh, would be, um, would form compound A, and A was a haloalkane, right, haloalkane. And so what this simply means is that we went from alkene and we formed, in this case, an alkane so that we could now form a substitution reaction because that's what they said. They said reaction four is a substitution reaction. So in this case, we formed haloalkane. And so as a result, they say the name of formula of the catalyst used in reaction three. Remember that whenever we are converting from alkenes to alkanes, we always use either uh, you can use iron or you can use nickel. Okay, so I'm just going to write them like that. And they say the IUPAC name of compound A. Now remember, uh, uh, compound D rather. Uh, so compound D, I am going to assume this is going to be our alkane, right? And in this case, because I formed an alkane, um, it would look exactly the same as uh, three, but in this case, it's going to have ane. So this is going to be uh, 3 comma 3 in fact uh, in this case it would be 2 comma 2 right because I'd actually name a number uh, from the left to the right okay so uh, where, where's the one that I had actually drawn there 
So remember I said it would have a double bond there, right? But if in this case we are hydrogenating it, um, right, so which means I can actually start numbering from left to right. And so that would be 2,2 dimethyl uh, propane. So 2,2 uh, dimethyl, uh, not propane rather, uh, but uh, butane. Okay, there'd be four carbons uh, there. So that would be butane. And then the next one, they say the type of reaction represented by reaction three. Okay, so remember we said reaction three must be in this case an addition reaction. Okay, from alkene to alkane. So that is going to be addition. And finally, they say the type of haloalkane represented by A, right? Is it a uh, primary, secondary, or tertiary? So um, let's see. So it, if we had a double bond there, uh, so definitely it would be a primary. And uh, let's see there. Uh, so the carbon that would have the halogen would be carbon number two. All right. So if we added, let's say, chloro there. Um, so it's surrounded by two other carbons. So it would be a secondary. Uh, so in this case, I'm just going to say this would be a secondary haloalkane. All right, ladies and gents, we are going to leave it there. And next, we are going to be looking at rates of reactions. So question number five. They say the reaction between aluminum and excess sulfuric acid is used to investigate the factors affecting the rates of reaction. So investigation one, they say the effect of a catalyst on the rate of reaction is determined. Right, so they say aluminium powder of mass 5 grams reacts with excess 0 0.1 moles per cubic decimeter uh, cubed of uh, sulfuric acid at 60 degrees. And they say consider the energy diagrams not drawn to scale for this investigation. And they say X and Y, okay, where's X and Y? So on that diagram, there they are on diagram number 2 or diagram B. Uh, represents the activation energies, right? Now, very important for you to note that uh, in this case, if I look at them, so one is with a catalyst and one without a catalyst. And um, so I'm going to uh, indicate that with different colors. So which means if I look at the activation energy, right, so that would be the activation energy. So the size of uh, energy Y, actually energy X, this would be energy X, right? And then for Y, this is now when you add a catalyst. So the activation energy with a catalyst would be that smaller value. And so that would be Y. So Y uh, would be the red and X with the blue. Right, so let's now answer the questions that follow. They say, is the reaction between aluminium and, di uh, and dilute sulfuric acid exothermic, endothermic or exothermic? Definitely, we are going to have an exothermic reaction there, right? But why is that? Okay, because the energy of the products is less than the energy of the reactants. So we can say that uh, delta H is less than zero, right? And remember, or you can simply say because the energy of the product, okay, would be less than the energy of the reactants, right? The potential energy of the products would be greater or less than the uh, potential energy for the reactants, right? And then they say to us, what does the shaded area to the right of the line P represent? Okay, so remember that this shaded area is showing us the number of particles with energy that is greater than the uh, activation energy, right? The minimum energy that is required. So uh, we can say that, okay, with a catalyst, 
right? Or we can just simply say that it represents the number of particles, right? So we said uh, it represents the number of particles uh, with sufficient kinetic energy. Uh, with sufficient kinetic energy. Right, so remember, uh, so sufficient kinetic energy. And remember that sufficient kinetic energy is the energy, kinetic energy that is greater than uh, the minimum that is required, which is the activation energy. So uh, the next one says determine the numerical value uh, represented by uh, the letter X, okay, on diagram B. Um, I'm not sure if it's worth saying that uh, uh, on uh, the previous question that that is the amount of sufficient kinetic energy with the catalyst, right? So uh, Y is with the catalyst, uh, but nonetheless, it is still the shaded area. Uh, so I don't think it would be that important. Okay, and uh, they wanted the value of uh, the letter X, right? So we said this is the minimum energy that is required right, in this case, for effective collisions to take place. So we said we indicated that with the blue. Uh, so that would be 240, right? So that would be this value here, 240.8 minus 208.2, all right? So um, if we take that value, uh, that would give us uh, 240 minus 208. That would give us 32, isn't it? Uh, 32.6. So, uh, in fact, let me show you how I got to the value. So, this would be 240.8 minus 208.2, and that would be 32.6 kilojoules. Okay, so that is the amount, uh, the minimum uh, energy that is required in that, in that case, right? Uh, for uh, that graph without the catalyst, okay? And if we wanted to find out the one for Y, we would have taken the value here at the activated complex for uh, for the one with the catalyst. Uh, so that would be 217.3 minus 208.2. Okay, but let's go to the next one, right? So uh, let me just remove that. Uh, I was just practicing a little bit earlier. So they say to us, investigation two, right? The diagram, uh, they say the investigation is now placed at 30 degrees using the same reactants, right? Five grams of aluminium powder and excess 0 0.1 mole per cubic decimeter sulfuric acid and a catalyst. So we still have the catalyst there. Now they want to know, how will this affect each of the following when compared with uh, to investigation one? They say choose increase, decrease, or remain the same. Now, firstly, they say the size of uh, the shaded area. Now, what I want you to note, ladies and gents, is that they've now decreased temperature, right? So what is temperature going to do it's going to now uh, create less uh, molecules, rather, with sufficient kinetic energy, right? It's going to lower the average kinetic energy, and now less of them will have sufficient kinetic energy. So what that simply means, ladies and gents, is that the size of the shaded area will decrease, okay? Right, so that will decrease. And then secondly, they say, what will that do on the value of Y? Uh, remember, Y was the activation energy, right? That is required. So that does nothing to the value of Y, right? Remember that uh, the activation energy remains the activation energy, right? It's just that less of the molecules would be able to have that activation energy, right? So in that case, uh, the value of Y remains the same. Okay, so that remains the same. And finally, they say the total volume of hydrogen gas produced. 
So, ladies and gents, what we see there is that the total volume won't remain the same because we've still got the same amount uh, of aluminium powder and the same amount of uh, um, sulfuric acid. So a volume of hydrogen gas that is produced should also be the same, right? It is just the rate that will change, but that amount would also remain the same. Okay, right, now let's go to the next one. They say in this investigation, five grams of the same sample of impure aluminium powder. So now the aluminium powder is impure, right? So in this case, it means that of the five grams, not all of it is actually the aluminium powder. They say with excess dilute sulfuric acid at 60 degrees in each of, um, in each of the three runs, right? They say the table below summarizes the conditions and the results obtained, right? Assume that impurities do not react. Okay, now uh, in run one, okay, our concentration was uh, 0 0.1 and we see that the average rate was 15. When we increase concentration, the rate also increased. And in this case, that is what we also see, uh, observe in run three right they say write down the independent variable for this investigation now remember what did we keep changing what did we vary as we went along it was the concentration of sulfuric acid so our independent variable is the concentration of h2so4 Right, and they say now use the collision theory to explain how the average rate of the reaction is affected uh, in, the, in this investigation. So, uh, firstly, let's just uh, explain there that an increase, right? So an increase, right, in concentration please if you don't mind i'm just going to abbreviate so an increase in concentration right will increase the number or in this case uh, will increase uh, the volume right uh, the number of collisions in this case per unit area or we can say that it will increase the number of particles per unit area right so we'll increase uh, particles particles per unit area right so this is per unit area right but remember now what does that do it means that more particles are now uh, going to collide all right which will increase the number of uh, effective collisions okay uh, per second or you can say that now more Particles will collide frequently, right, which will increase the number of particles with sufficient kinetic energy and correct orientation, and that will increase the rate of the reaction. All right, so I'm not going to be able to write all of that down, uh, but that is the explanation. You can rerun that again, right, uh, and just listen to that again. Right, so in this case for 5.3.3, they say the time for the reaction uh, for, uh, to reach completion, rather in run three, is 2.6 uh, minutes. They say calculate the percentage purity of aluminium. Take the molar volume of uh, 60 at 60 degrees to be 27,000 cubic centimeters per mole. All right, ladies and gents. So remember, we are getting there the volume of hydrogen produced per second right so now i know that average rate now note so the average rate of the reaction right so it's in volume per second so this would be the change in volume divided by change in time okay so they've given us the average rate there in cubic centimeters 
this is 40 okay so which means my volume has to be in cubic centimeters right so that would be the change in volume and remember we would have started with nothing right divided by the change in time they told us the time is 2.6 minutes okay so let's multiply that by 60 uh, 2.6 times 60 right so that's 156 seconds right and i'm converting it to seconds because my rate is in per second so that means that this is multiplied by uh, we said 156 so that would be 156 right and what is this going to give us this is going to give us the volume right so the change in volume in this case would be 40 times 156 okay so this is multiplied by 40 and i get a volume of 6240 cubic centimeters right 6240 cubic centimeters now notice ladies and gents this is the amount of volume of uh, hydrogen that i would have produced uh, in that amount of time right but now let's convert that into number of moles right and what do i do i know that number of moles is volume divided by the molar volume and my molar volume is already in cubic centimeters as well so I'm going to leave it in that form. So this is the number of moles of hydrogen, right? So this is going to be 6,240. And by the way, um, I'm leaving it uh, in that because the initial volume was zero. So in this case, this means this is the total volume that's produced. So this is divided by 27,000, right? Cubic centimeters per mole, okay? And let's see what we get there so that's two three uh, six two four zero divided by twenty seven thousand and i get a value of zero point two three okay so this is zero point two three of course i'm gonna keep that value uh, for a bit with all of those decimals right because i do not want to lose uh, in this case the significant values right so uh, 0 0.23 so this is the number of moles of hydrogen that i would have produced right and we are going to use a molar ratio in this case and say right so for every two moles of aluminium we're going to get three moles of hydrogen right so we're going to write that down and say well for every two moles of aluminium we're going to get three moles of hydrogen, right? So now note, these were the moles of hydrogen that we got, right? So the question is, for how many moles of aluminium will we get 0 0.23 moles of hydrogen? So remember what you do is you cross multiply here, right? So what is this going to give us? This is going to give us uh, 3 times n, right? There it is there. That will be 3n and 2 times 0 0.23. Okay, so there's our value over there, right? We're going to say multiplied by uh, 2. Okay, and we are going to divide by 3. Okay, right. So we get a value of 0 0.154. Okay, so if we take that, our n value would be 0 0.154. Now, I'm not going to get rid of that value as well, right? So now, that's the number of moles of aluminium that would have been produced, okay? Right, now, very important, ladies and gents, okay, that we are now going to compare. Remember, we want the percentage purity, so let's find out what would be the mass of aluminium that would give us that amount, right? So we're going to go into the periodic table, right? I'm just going to scroll down quickly and go into our periodic table and find aluminium there. Okay, so you can see aluminium is 27. That's the molar mass. Okay, and now that means that we are going to use that to get the mass of aluminium 
say, well, the mass of aluminium will be number of moles multiplied by molar mass. Remember, this is from the formula that uh, is N is equals to M over big M, right? Uh, so in this case, uh, we'll, uh, this will give us M, right? The mass of aluminium that reacted would be 0 0.154 multiplied by 27. Okay, so what do we get there, right? So I keep that value. I'm just simply going to multiply by 27. Okay, and I get another value 4.16. Okay, so this is going to give us 4.16 grams. Now remember, which means this is the pure aluminium that actually reacted. So we want to calculate the percentage purity, if you don't mind. Uh, I'm just going to do it over here. We wanted the percentage purity of aluminium. So this is going to be the mass of the pure aluminium divided by the total mass of the aluminium multiplied by 100. Now, the pure mass was 4.16, the one that we got, right? Divided by the 5 grams that was given to us and multiply that by 100, right? So we're going to say, well, 4.16 divided by 5, okay? And we multiply that by 100. And so it was 83.2% pure. So that's 83.2% pure. All right, now I know that is uh, quite a bit. Okay, so remember we calculated the volume of hydrogen, right, using the rate of reactions. And we found out the number of moles of hydrogen using our molar volume that was given, right? We therefore used the stoichiometric ratios to find out the number of moles of aluminium, in which case we also got the mass of aluminium in this case. And from that mass, we could now determine the percentage purity uh, over there. Right, I hope that that made sense, ladies and gents, All right, as we are going to go into the next question. And now we go on to question six, ladies and gents. Uh, before I start with this question, let me first of all register my disappointment yet again um, that, you know, we seem to have yet another year and yet another error in a question paper. I think this is seeming to be, uh, you know, quite a thing now uh, where we are simply finding errors. And you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, I am going to try and fix the error and therefore, you know, answer this question. But I want you to see this. So um, we're given there, they say, consider the balanced equation for a hypothetical reaction that takes place in a two cubic decimeter container. They say the graphs below are not drawn to scale and obtained for the same reaction, for the same reaction, right, at two different temperatures. Now, I want you to note that it's for the same reaction, but at different temperature. Now, notice that in graph A, we seem to have P -Q, uh, P2Q, right? We're starting with that as a reactant, and it makes sense for it to start with a reactant that is at a certain amount of moles or concentration. And we know that our P2Q would decrease as time goes on as we form the product. And so that decreases. And in this case, we are shown PQ2 uh, increasing in terms of its amount. Now that makes sense, right? All right, now, but now look at graph B. All of a sudden, we've got PQ2, uh, P2Q as a reactant, okay? So notice in this case, PQ2, P2Q, right? In the solid line. So I truly believe this must have been an error because if you look at this, uh, if it is the same reaction, then it means that we must have started with nothing in terms of P2, uh, um, I mean, in terms of uh, P, PQ2, right, which is this guy over here. So I am going to change this around. Uh, please understand, ladies and gents, 
So that represents PQ2, right? And which means this one would represent P2Q. So I'm going to remove that 2 over there. Right, I hope that you understand, ladies and gents, uh, because, I mean, it really affects the way in which we are going to answer this question. All right, now let's go right into the question. And you'll see even later on as we uh, answer the equilibrium question, uh, how that will have an effect on how we answer the question. All right, let's go into it. And uh, they say state Le Chatelier's principle. We know the Le Chatelier's principle in a closed system. If one of the factors that affect equilibrium changes, then the equilibrium will oppose the change and a new equilibrium will be established, right? And they ask us, what do the parallel lines uh, after t is equals to five minutes in graph A represent? So we know that that, equi uh, that represents uh, equilibrium. Uh, in this case, we can say, uh, it represents chemical equilibrium. So very important for us, right? Uh, equilibrium. Okay, so that shows us equilibrium. All right. Uh, nothing wrong if you decide to call it a dynamic equilibrium. Okay, uh, I just wrote this incorrectly. So that's equilibrium. All right, so that is it uh, right there. Now, let's go on to the next question, right? So if I look at this, so now they're asking us the question, is the forward reaction exothermic or endothermic? Right, now I want you to please note this, ladies and gents. So we, on graph number two, we increased the temperature. Now let's see what the uh, increase in temperature uh, affected in terms of the performance of this reaction. Right. So when we increase temperature, look at this. Our amount of P, uh, PQ2, which is our product, right? So PQ2 was 0 0.4 at a lower temperature. And all of a sudden, do you see why this has to be PQ2? So PQ2 now becomes 0 0.35 at a higher temperature. What does this tell you, right? That an increase in temperature does not favor the production of PQ2, right? So which means an increase in temperature favors the reverse reaction. That tells you that the reverse reaction is endothermic, right? Uh, rather, yeah, so it favored the, the reverse reaction. So that tells you that the reverse reaction is endothermic. I hope that makes sense, ladies and gents. So remember that an increase in temperature always favors the endothermic reaction. So in answering that question, they said, is the forward reaction uh, exothermic or endothermic? So remember, in this case, we did say that um, if the reverse reaction is endothermic, then it means that the forward reaction is exothermic. So I'm going to go with uh, uh, choosing six uh, for 6.3 rather. Uh, I am going to go with that uh, answer there, which is exothermic. Okay, right. So I hope that makes sense, ladies and gents. Right. Now they say to you, explain the answer in 6.3. So, so we said our answer, first of all, is exothermic. Okay, exothermic. Right, now for 6.4, I want you to note, so what did we say? An increase, um, an increase in temperature. Okay, we know that an increase in temperature favors um, the... Okay, so note that uh, an increase in temperature favors the endothermic reaction, right? Favors endothermic reaction, okay? But in this case, we note that the reverse reaction is favored. So the reverse reaction is favored, okay? And how do we notice that? Is favored, rather. How do we notice that? We notice that because... Uh, our yield of PQ2 was lower at a higher temperature. So the reverse reaction is favored. Okay. So therefore, the reverse reaction 
uh, is endothermic. The reverse reaction, rather, is endothermic. Okay? And so if the reverse reaction is endothermic, right, therefore the forward reaction, uh, therefore forward reaction is exothermic. Okay, so the forward reaction must be exothermic. Okay, right, I hope that makes sense, um, is exothermic. Okay, so um, in this case, ladies and gents, you could have also explained it in this manner that an increase in temperature, right, um, gives a lower yield of PQ2, right? So in this case, it means that um, the, re the forward reaction is therefore not endothermic. And so therefore, it must be exothermic. Okay, right. Now let's go to the next question. They say, how does the value of the equilibrium constant Kc for the reaction in graph B compared to that in graph A, right? This is emphasizing why we must make the change that we spoke about earlier on. So uh, it says to us, uh, choose from greater than, less than, or equal to. Now notice in this case, we had a, a lower yield of uh, PQ2 at a higher temperature. So it therefore tells us, and please remember that uh, it's only temperature that will affect the Kc value. So in this case, we know that our Kc value will be definitely less than. Okay, so remember, because we've got a lower yield, uh, we've got a lower concentration of products, so it must tell us that uh, our Kc will be less than the initial one. All right, so let's go to the next question. The uh, equilibrium constant Kc at 0 0.49 at, um, is 0 0.49 rather at 398 Kelvin. So this is for this graph, um, the uh, graph B. Right, so this graph B, this is the one that happens at 398 Kelvin. So this would be the temperature that has to do, I mean, this is the Kc that has to do with that temperature. And again, ladies and gents, I'm emphasizing that is why we needed to change because remember, P2Q is our reactant, right? So there's no way that I can start uh, with zero reactants, all right, and expect that I will get something. So we are looking for the initial amount of P2Q, right? So that um, we get that Kc. Now notice, ladies and gents, we are given information in terms of concentration, right? So I'm going to uh, maintain that. So even as I draw my table, right? So I'm, uh, let's draw a rice table. Okay, so but my rice table this time around will actually be made of concentrations, right? Uh, so I don't need that many slots. And you'll see how we can draw that table using concentration of um, uh, the concentrations that we have, right? So I'm going to say this is going to be initial, right? That's now going to be in moles per cubic decimeters. Now, because this happens in the same uh, vessel, all right? So we can actually use our ratio in terms of uh, those um, uh, concentrations. Uh, this is change in moles per cubic decimeters. Okay, and by the way, there's nothing wrong if you use moles, right? You can always convert all of those amounts in terms of moles. Okay, and this would be equilibrium. Okay, and this would be in moles per cubic decimeters. Right, so now remember, uh, initially, I have got uh, P2Q and 3Q. Okay, so that's PQ2 and 3Q, right? So that's one of that and three of uh, 3Q. And in this case, that would give us uh, two moles of PQ2. Okay, so that was supposed to be P2Q. Sorry about that. Okay, so that's P2Q, and in this case, that will give us two moles of PQ2. Now, let's look at our graph. What does our graph actually indicate? So, our graph tells us that we started with an unknown amount of uh, P2Q, our reactant. So, 
but we started with zero moles uh, per cubic decimeter of our um, product, right? So initially, I will have an X amount of PQ2. Now notice they don't say anything much about 3Q. And remember, ladies and gents, the reason why we can exclude this for now is because remember, as solids do not actually have a constant, uh, um, uh, you know, concentration. So in this case, it means that we can exclude 3Q because remember, it is a solid, right? So nothing wrong with that. However, ladies and gents, please just note that when you draw the one for number of moles, please include those solids because sometimes uh, it might be necessary, um, especially when you are calculating in initial mass and things like those. Okay, right. So in this case, I started with an X amount, but for P uh, Q2, I started with zero, right? Now, notice they also give me an equilibrium amount. So when I look at this graph, the graph tells me that I've got an amount of PQ2, uh, P, yeah, PQ2, which is our product in this case. I've got 0 0.35 moles per cubic decimeters at equilibrium, right? So when I go to my equilibrium, I'll say, well, my equilibrium amount is 0 0.35, okay? Now notice, ladies and gents, so which means now I can find out how much it changed. I started with nothing and at the end I've got 0 0.35. How much did I use? Okay, I'm going to use a different color there. It means that, sorry, I, I produced 0 0.35. And now, ladies and gents, you must keep in mind, this is where I'm going to use my stoichiometric ratio. I'm going to say for every one of P to Q, I get two moles of PQ2. So the question is for how many moles, right? Let me use N, right? Of P to Q, will I get 0 0.35? And all there is to it is cross multiply two times N, that will give me two N. One times 0 0.35, that will be 0 0.35. And if I divide by two, uh, there, the number of moles of P to Q that I will get, uh, this will be 0. Point, okay, so 35, that will be 7175, right? All right, so uh, ladies and gents, I want you to please note, so I'm going to take that amount. So this will be 0. 0.175 uh, of this. Right, now, uh, note that if I take this now, okay, I'm going to say, well, I started with X, right? And I used 0 0.175, okay? So in this case, I started with an X amount and I used 0 0.175. What do I have at the end? I've got X minus, remember that is our reactant, so that means at the end, I've got X minus 0 0.175. Right, ladies and gents, I think we're ready to use our KC uh, um, expression. So KC, we know that's the molar concentration of our product. Our product is PQ2. So that's going to be PQ2. But remember, this is squared divided by the molar concentration of our reactants. That's P2Q, right? That's P2Q, all right? But we know that KC, they gave us that value as 0 0.49. Remember that, no? Right, so they said this is equal to 0 0.49. Okay, that's our KC value. So now let's, let's substitute. The molar concentration of our product, so this is going to be 0 0.35 squared divided by, we said that gives us x minus 0 0.175, and this is equal to 0 0.49. Okay, so I'm going to make this over 1. All right, ladies and gents, if we cross multiply, I'll have 0 0.49. Okay, let's try and do this as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, x minus 
0 0.175, which is equal to 0 0.35 squared uh, multiplied by 1. Okay, so we can divide by 0 0.49 on either side. So that will be divided by 0 0.49. Okay, uh, that cancels with that. Now you've got x is equal to that fraction 0 0.35 squared over 0 0.49. Okay, and I'm going to take the 0 0.175 to the other side. It becomes positive. Okay, so let's do that on our calculator. Right, so that gives us 0 0.35 squared divided by 0 0.49. Okay, we get our answer there. This is plus 0 0.175. And this gives us x is equal to 0 0.425. Now remember, in this case, uh, x is in moles per cubic decimeters. That's the initial concentration, right? But now, remember what are we looking for? We are looking for the initial, they said to us, uh, we must uh, calculate the initial number of moles. And remember, our volume was two cubic decimeters. So we're going to say, right, so for number of moles, concentration is number of moles over volume, but number of moles would be there for concentration times volume. So this will be 0 0.425 multiplied by the volume, uh, which is 2. Okay, and in this case, I'm just simply going to take that, multiply it by 2. That will give us 0 0.85 moles. So this was the initial number of moles of PQ2. Okay, uh, uh, P2, yeah, P2Q. Uh, at the beginning all right so please ladies and gents i want you to note that error uh, and really for me again i'm i'm do i do say that uh, you know it is uh, quite disappointing to see these things continuing to happen um you know we 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 have to do better in terms of setting the standard of the exam uh, you know to international norms Right, so let's go to the next question. So they say, describe the change made to the equilibrium system at t is equals to 8 minutes, right, as shown in graph B at constant temperature. Now, I want you to note in this case, what happened to graph B, right? So we go back to the graph and we say, all right, so something happened and note that both concentrations right, were drastically in, uh, decreased, right, in a very short space of time. So both concentrations were decreased. So this says to me, all right, we must have actually done something uh, to affect the concentration of both our um, uh, products and our reactants. So I truly believe when I look at this, there must have been a change in concentration, okay? So there must have been a change, uh, or rather, uh, not change in concentration, rather, a change in the volume of the container, right? Now, I want you to note in this case, what would cause, now, if you think about concentration, right? Concentration is number of moles divided by volume, right? So in this case, it means that if I were to, uh, increase uh, the concentrate or rather decrease the, the 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 pressure okay so if i were to decrease the pressure how do i decrease pressure i make the space bigger so i increase my volume right so if i increase the volume i want you to think about it ladies and gents so if i increase my volume in this case uh, what would happen is i would actually cause my concentration to decrease. And by the way, uh, in this case, it would be the concentration of both uh, reactants because that's the definition of what concentration is, right? Now, let's think about, um, you know, what happens at equilibrium there, right? So if we disturb uh, the volume, if we make the volume bigger, right? Uh, according to Le Chatelier's uh, principle, 
we will favor the side that has a greater number of moles. Now, if you haven't watched my video uh, on graphs of uh, chemical equilibrium, please do yourself a favor and watch that. Okay, so in this case, now note, uh, if I decrease, uh, rather, if I increase the volume, right, I am going to now favor the side with the more, uh, uh, you know, that occupies a greater volume, that uh, occupies two moles uh, in this case. So it means that that will now begin to increase. And you can see thereafter my um, concentration of P2Q begins to increase gradually, whilst that of P2Q my reactant seems to decrease okay so in this case what happened all right so they say describe the change uh, that was made so the change that was made all right so that is 6.7 so the change made was an a decrease or rather an increase in volume Okay, or you can simply say uh, a an increase, right? Uh, rather, a decrease in pressure, a decrease in pressure. Okay, right. So please note there, ladies and gents, that's really the change that we went through, and then finally, uh, they say to us. Uh, explain by using Le Chatelier's principle how the system reacts to the change in question 6.7. Now, we did say that an increase, so 6.8, we're simply saying an, a decrease, rather, in pressure. So, decrease in pressure. Right, will favor... Right, the side that occupies more volume, okay, will favor the side that occupies more volume, okay, and so that means that the forward reaction is favored, right, so there my spelling is going away. Uh, the forward reaction is favored because the products the products occupy a greater volume right occupy a greater volume all right so uh, please remember that ladies and gents once i increase pressure I, I make this the volume smaller, I will favor the side. Now, when you look at this reaction, ladies and gents, and please note that you always compare gases, right? So when I look at the left-hand side, there's only one mole of gas there. And on the right-hand side, I've got two moles of gas. So remember that when I make the space smaller, I will favor the side with less gas moles. And please remember not to add any solids or liquids when you are adding number of moles of gases, right? Uh, in this case, so there was one only on the left-hand side and there were two on the right-hand side. So the products occupy a greater volume. And as a result, when you make the volume bigger, in this case, would convert to the side that occupies a bigger volume. And that's why you see that increase there in the, in the amount of PQ2, all right? And it does validate what we had said again uh, i won't stop saying this that uh, it does validate the fact that there was an error i do hope that we will do better as a country in terms of setting uh, exams that are you know in line with international standards all right ladies and gents let's go to the next question all right so we look at uh, question seven a standard solution is prepared by dissolving 10 grams of sodium carbonate in 0 0.7 cubic decimeters of water. So they say calculate the concentration of the solution. 
right so we're going to use our known equation so we've got the mass there so I'm going to say concentration this is going to be mass divided by molar mass times the volume right so we've got 10 grams right and now we're gonna go to um, the periodic table for sodium carbonate now remember uh, sodium okay so sodium carbonate so there are two atoms of sodium so this is two times remember that sodium is 23 plus carbon which is 12 plus three times oxygen which is 16 okay so that would give us um, two times 23 uh, plus 12 plus 16 times 3 that's going to give us 106 right and this is multiplied by the volume and the volume there is given to us as 0 0.7 uh, sorry that I'm writing on top of that number there so this would be 0 0.7 and so what do we get uh, for that so this would be 10 divided by 106 multiplied by 0 0.7 okay so i get a concentration of 0 0.13 okay so we can say 0 0.14 moles per cubic decimeters nothing wrong if you said 0 0.13 right so 0 0.14 and they say will the ph of the solution uh, be greater than or less than seven so we are talking about sodium carbonate over there right so this would have been formed uh, by reaction with a strong base and a weak acid so this is a, a definitely a basic salt so the ph of this solution should be greater than seven so our answer should be greater than all right and they say to you write down write an equation to explain the answer uh, in 7.1.2 now remember this is where we are going to use the uh, the the hydrolysis of salts right so remember that sodium carbonate would come from sodium hydroxide okay and carbonic acid so those are the two where it would come from but we know that carbonic acid is a weak acid so it would give rise to a strong conjugate so which means i'm going to take co3 2 minus okay uh, plus h2o and in that case i am going to form hco3 minus okay plus oh minus and the fact that we've got hydroxide ions is what will cause our ph to be less than zero so that's the equation that we are going to write so the next one they say to us the sodium carbonate solution is titrated with dilute uh, hydrochloric acid and they say the following uh, indicators are available for this titration all right now um we are going to uh, so they give us PQ and R, which have those ranges over there. Okay, so they say which one of the indicators P, uh, Q or R is most suitable for this titration. Give a reason for the answer by referring to the data in the table. Right, now remember, uh, we are taking there an alkali uh, salt in this case. Okay, which is sodium carbonate right that is a base okay so in this case it would be a weak base by the way and we are now taking it with hydrochloric acid a strong acid right so which means that when we react that we are actually going to get a uh, uh, we actually going to get an acidic salt okay so in this case i would definitely take p right so p would be the one that i'd consider okay uh, in this case because we've got the reaction of a strong acid okay the, so this is a strong acid and a weak base 
okay? And those would give us a an acidic salt. So you remember that that um, you choose an a uh, an indicator based on the type of salt that you are going to get. All right, ladies and gents. So that is what we are going to have there. Now on the last one, they say to us when zero point zero one moles of dilute sulfuric acid is mixed with 0.024 moles of potassium hydroxide, the volume of the final solution is 0.2. So they ask us what is meant by a dilute acid, right? So this is when a small number of moles of acid, right, is, uh, is placed in a large volume of water, right? So that's what dilute simply means. Okay, so uh, they say calculate the pH of the final solution. Now, I want you to keep in mind, ladies and gents. So we're taking, remember they didn't say we are neutralizing or this is a titration, right? But essentially what we are doing is we are taking an acid, right? And we are reacting it with a base. So what I realize here is that we are going to have one of them being in excess, and remember, whatever remains in excess will now determine our resulting solution. Now, let me do this. If I look at the number of moles of the acid, 0 0.01 and those of the base, right? Uh, these look like they are much bigger, right, for the base. So if I use 0 0.01 moles of the acid, how much base would actually and react completely with that acid, right? So that's what I'm going to do to get the number of moles that are in excess. So I'm going to say, well, for according to the reaction, it says for two moles of potassium hydroxide, I'm going to use one mole of sulfuric acid. Okay. But so for how many moles? of sodium hydroxide, am I going to use all of the moles of acid, which is 0 0.01? I'm sure you can see where I'm going with this. So N times one would give me N, and two times 0 0.02 will give me, uh, as, uh, 0 0.01 times two rather, will give me 0 0.02 moles. So which means the moles of potassium hydroxide that would react completely, that would completely neutralize with that acid uh, would be 0 0.02. But how many moles of uh, potassium hydroxide do I have? I'm given 0 0.04, uh, 24, right? So which means the number of moles in excess of the um, potassium hydroxide, so the one that would not react with the acid, First, I'll take the initial minus the number of moles that would react, let's say the ones that were used. So this would be 0 0.024 minus 0 0.02. And so which means 0 0.004 moles would be in excess. Now the moles in excess would be the ones that determine the concentration or rather the pH of the resulting solution. Now, remember, this is the excess moles of potassium hydroxide, right? So can I get the concentration from that? Absolutely, right? So I'm going to say the concentration is number of moles divided by volume. So this would be 0 0.004. This is the excess moles divided by my volume. And they said to me the resulting uh, volume, the total volume of the mixture is 0 0.2. So I'm going to divide that by 0 0.2. So I'm going to say 0 0.002 divided, uh, sorry, 0 0.004 rather, uh, divided by 0 0.2. And so I get 0 0.02. So that's 0 0.02 moles per cubic decimeters. So meaning in our, con in, um, in our mixture, right, the concentration of the resulting potassium hydroxide, right? Remember the acid would have completely been neutralized, right? So there's no acid that is left. 
So all that we are left with is potassium hydroxide. So this would be its concentration. But remember, how does potassium hydroxide ionize? Right, it becomes, oh, actually, how does it dissociate? Right, so that's what it, uh, that's how it dissociates. So now, it, which means the potassium hydroxide concentration will be equal to the hydroxide ion concentration. So therefore, it means that the concentration of our hydroxide ions will be equal to 0 0.002 moles per cubic decimeters. Now, ladies and gents, you can calculate the POH, right? And say this is minus the logarithm of the hydroxide ion concentration. And so this would be minus the log of 0 0.02. Okay, and what does that give us? So that would be minus the log 0 0.02. Uh, I get 1.69 or you can say 1.7. So I'll just say 1.7. So now we're going to say pH plus pOH will be equal to 14. So therefore, it means that pH will be equal to 14 minus pOH, which is 1.7. And so my pH value will be 14 minus 1.7. And so that will give us 12.3. So that's how I will get the pH of my resulting mixture. Now, ladies and gents, um, what you could have done as well was to use the ionization constant of water, that's H3O plus times OH minus, right? And so what you could have done is to find out what the concentration of H3O plus, remember that KW is 10 to the minus 14, right? So if I find the concentration of H3O plus, uh, that will be uh, just divided by the concentration of OH minus, and so as a result, you can calculate the pH in that way. Right. And essentially, acids and bases is done, ladies and gents. And we are going to move to the next question. And now we go on to question eight. So they say to us, we've got the relationship uh, between the concentration of the electrolyte and the cell potential is investigated using the following electrochemical cell represented by the cell notation. So we've got aluminium and aluminium three plus ions there, right? So remember that a cell notation, ladies and gents, is always, always standard. So if you look at that, that's going to be our anode. And uh, of course, that's going to be our cathode. Okay, so remember, if it's a cell notation, it is always standard like that, that uh, whatever is on the left will be on your, will be your anode. So in this case, we've got uh, the concentration of M2 plus is changed and the corresponding EMF is measured, right? They say the concentration of aluminium 3 plus, and the temperature, um, sorry, are set at standard conditions. They say the graph below shows the results of this investigation. Now, ladies and gents, there we are. We've got an EMF versus uh, a concentration of M2 plus graph. They say identify the reducing agent in the cell. Now, remember that the reducing agent is the uh, substance that undergoes oxidation. And what undergoes oxidation? That's going to be our anode, right? So our anode in this case, as I did say to you, that's simply going to be aluminium. Okay, so that's going to be our reducing agent. So they say to us, uh, determine the concentration of M2 plus that will produce an EMF of 1.87. Now, ladies and gents, it's very important for us to be able to interpret a graph. Okay, so uh, firstly, I'm going to start on this side over here, right? And I'm going to say, right, so first of all, I need to note what are the cell increments, right? So uh, if I look at uh, those, that's going to be 1.8 minus the 1.7, okay, 
that will give me okay so if i say 1.8 minus the 1.7 okay that will give me 1.1 right and if i divide that okay so note i'm going to say 1.8 minus the 1.7 okay i get the 0 0.1 and note that it's going to be uh, divided by, all right, so my answer is going to be divided by 10. Now, why am I dividing it by 10? Because that will be now the uh, increment per cell, right? So I will have an increment of 0 0.01, okay? So I want you to note that means that uh, for every, so this will be 1.71, 1.72, uh, and so on, right? So I want 1.87, so there's 1.8 over there, right? So that will be 1.85, 1 0.86, 1 1.87, so there it is over there, right? But if I now bring this down and say, well, what is the corresponding concentration value, right? So it is that value over there. Now let's try and find out what are the cell increments here. So we have 0 0.5 minus 0 0.25, which will give us 0 0.25. And if we divide that by 10, so we're taking 0 0.25, divide that by 10, that will give us 0 0.025. So that will be the increments, right? So which means each one here is an increase by 0 0.025. So we've got 0 0.025 increasing three times, right? So I'm going to multiply that by three. But remember, we are not starting from zero. We are starting from 0 0.25. So... I'm going to say we've got 0 0.25 plus 0 0.025 multiplied by 3. I hope that makes sense. So this value here will be 0 0.325. Okay, so that's our concentration. So we know that the concentration of M2 plus at that uh, EMF, will be equal to 0 0.325 moles per cubic decimeters. All right, I hope that makes sense. Now they say to us, how will the concentration of M2 plus be affected as the cell operates? Right, choose increase, decrease, or remain the same. So remember, M2 plus, uh, that's our cathode, isn't it? Uh, uh, M rather is our cathode. So that means uh, it is undergoing reduction. So what's happening here? M2 plus will gain electrons and in this case become M. So which means the concentration of our M2 plus ions should definitely decrease. So that is our answer, All right? It will decrease and uh, um, they say give a reason for your answer. Right, so remember that uh, M2 plus undergoes reduction. Um, or we can say M2 plus ions are reduced. Okay. Uh, by the gain of electrons, right? By the gain of electrons. Okay. Uh, to form, right, so to form M, right, so in this case, therefore, the concentration will decrease, all right. Now, the next question, they say to us, potassium nitrate is used in the salt bridge, okay, to which electrode will the K ions move in the salt bridge, Right, so remember, what the salt bridge does is that it neutralizes excess ions, right? So what we've now indicated, uh, and I want you guys to uh, simply note this. So what we've indicated there is that uh, we had um, M2 plus ions that would, in this case, be uh, undergo reduction, 
And what they would leave behind, remember, are the negative, elect, uh, negative ions. All right. And so those negative ions in this case would therefore uh, react with K plus in the periodic in the uh, salt bridge uh, to try and neutralize. Right. So they say to which electrode will the K plus ions move in the salt bridge? So will it go to aluminium or will it go to M? Uh, definitely it will go to M. Why? Because in this case, we need to neutralize those excess um, uh, N ions, right? Negative ions. Right. And then uh, let's go to the next question quickly. They say identify metal M with the aid of a calculation. All right. So what we're going to do, ladies and gents, is we need to be very careful here. If we're going to use our E cell or E standard notation, so E cell, that's going to be E cathode, right? Uh, minus E anode. So E cathode minus E anode. All right. So, so ladies and gents, what we need to go and check. Remember, they already told us that our anode was at standard conditions, right? So we have to look for the E cell, right? That would fit in this case, standard conditions. And so, which means we're going to have to find the value uh, of the EMF where our M2 plus is at standard conditions, that is at one mole per cubic decimeters, right? So I am going to do that there's one mole per cubic decimeters there. Okay. What is our EMF value that relates to that? That is going to be two volts. So I'm going to say, well, it means our E cell is two volts. Our cathode is M. And that's the one that we don't know. Okay. And our anode right? We said it is aluminium. Now we need to go to our standard reduction potentials table and let's find the, um, let's find aluminium there, All right? Uh, let's try and find it as quickly as possible. So that's negative 1.66, right? So we know that we are dealing with aluminium over there, right? So this is minus a negative 1.66, right? So now negative times a negative becomes a positive. So that would be plus 1.66, right? Now notice, ladies and gents, when I take it to the other side, I end up having 2 minus 1.66. So which means our cathode, our standard value uh, for the cathode will be 2 minus uh, 1.66, 1.66, and that would give me positive 0 0.34 volts. Okay, so that's positive 0 0.34 volts. All right, so now I want you to note, we're going to go back to our um, standard cell notation, uh, I mean, um, a reduction table. Okay, let's look for something that would give us positive 0 0.34. Uh, that's definitely going to be our dear friend copper there. So which means M is actually copper. All right, so let's go there. And so that means that uh, M is therefore equal to copper. All right, now they say to us, metal M is now replaced with magnesium, okay? So which means we are replacing copper with magnesium. Now I'm going to go there to my table and look where is copper and where is magnesium. Okay, so magnesium right at the bottom there, right? And notice they are saying that these are increasing in uh, reduce in strength, rather of reducing agent. Uh, and this one is increasing in the strength of oxidizing agent. So what does that mean, uh, ladies and gents? It means that if I look at Mg2+, right, it has a lower strength, 
right? As an oxidizing agent than copper, all right? If I look at uh, magnesium, so now looking at it on this side, it means that magnesium has got a higher strength as an oxidizing agent than copper. Okay, so very important for you to note that. Okay, so they said to us, uh, our question is, they say, which electrode, aluminium or magnesium, will be the anode? All right. Now notice, um, you've now taken, um, uh, you've replaced copper, right, with magnesium. Okay. So remember our ANC rule. So you can go and check, right, uh, our, our, our ANC rule and say, all right. So this time, remember that uh, aluminium had minus 1.66, right, and um, magnesium is okay so that was so there's aluminium there negative 1.66 right and which means magnesium is minus uh, 2.36 so definitely uh, your magnesium will be the anode in that case right so magnesium will be our anode okay right so we're going to say magnesium okay now they say refer to the relative strength of oxidizing agents to explain the answer. So remember oxidizing agent is on the right, okay, of your table, right? So what can we say? We will say, well, actually magnesium has a greater strength of oxidizing, uh, as, uh, of uh, oxidizing rather, um, actually, let's oxidizing agent is actually on the right uh, left hand side sorry so which means that if we look at this it means aluminium has got a greater strength of oxidizing agent right than magnesium okay and so that is why in this case magnesium would undergo oxidation all right or that's why uh, aluminium would therefore undergo reduction so that's how we are going to explain and really, ladies and gents, it really becomes easy uh, because the table actually gives you that. Uh, so I'm going to leave it there, all right, as we go to the next question. And on the last one, question nine. So they say we've got a simplified diagram below that represents a cell used for electroplating ornaments with silver, uh, which is we've got P and Q are the uh, two terminals of the battery, right? So we are electroplating. So this is going to be our ornament that we are electroplating. And remember that the one that we're trying to electroplate will make, will connect that to the negative side of the cell. And in this case, which means because we are electroplating with silver, our silver will be on the positive electrode. So this guy should be the silver and our ornament should be on the negative side of the cell. Now they say to us, uh, state the energy conversion that takes place in the cell. Uh, remember, we are converting electrical energy, okay, into, right, so into chemical energy. All right. So which terminal uh, of the battery, P or Q, is negative? Well, it will definitely be il, uh, terminal P, okay? Right, whatever you are electroplating, uh, you must put on the negative side. Now, they say write down the equation for the half cell reaction that takes place at the cathode, right? So, remember the cathode is the electrode that undergoes, um, uh, you know, a reduction in this case. So we know what reduction is. It's the gain of electrons. So we're going to say, well, we know we're going to have. And the beautiful thing about, um, you know, the electroplating is that you've got the same reaction, but just in reverse that happens in both uh, of the electrodes. So here we are reducing. So that's Ag plus. Okay, I must just show that's a small plus there uh, with one electron. Okay, please note with one arrow, ladies and gents, that will give me 
silver. Okay, right. So the last question. They say, calculate the current needed to electroplate the ornament with 3.25 grams uh, of silver in 30 minutes. All right. Now, what am I going to do? We want to calculate current. So ultimately, I must come to this point where I've got charge divided by the change in time. So I must find out how much charge is there. All right. Uh, in this case. So what I'm going to do, ladies and gents, I'm going to say, uh, look, let's find out the number of moles, right, of silver. So I'm going to say number of moles of silver. This will be mass divided by molar mass. Okay, that's 3.25. But what's the molar mass of silver? Okay, if we go to our periodic uh, table, uh, silver is 108. So this is divided by 108. Okay, so let's try to calculate that. Okay, so that's going to be 3.25 divided by 108. Okay, that gives me 0 0.03. Right, so that's the number of moles uh, of, um, of silver, right? Now remember, for every one mole of silver ions or one mole of silver, you have one mole of electrons, isn't it? So therefore, the number of moles of the electrons should also be equal to 0 0.03 moles. Now remember, in this case, I want to find out the number of electrons, okay, and use Avogadro's constant, right? So... Avogadro's number, because remember, electrons are particles, so the number of moles will be number of electrons, right, divided by Avogadro's constant, okay, right, so our number of moles is 0 0.03, right, we want to find out the number, and I'll show you why I'm looking for the number of electrons, right, because we must calculate the charge, so divided by Avogadro's constant, so there it is over there, 6.02, okay, 6.02 times 10 to the exponent 23. So how many electrons were there, right? I still have the number here, so I'm not going to remove it. I'm going to say multiplied by 6.02, okay, exponent 23. Right, so I get that very huge number over there. All right, so that's 181 point uh, something, 157 times 10 to the exponent 20. Now, of course, yeah, yours might look different. Uh, my calculator is set to engineering, so yours might be actually, uh, let me write it in the format that you're bound to uh, find it in. That's 1.81 times 10 to the exponent 22, right? So those are the number of electrons, right? Now, so remember, each electron carries charge, right? And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, let's find the charge, the cumulative charge of those electrons. So from electrostatics, you know that the charge would be the number of electrons multiplied by the unit charge of an electron. So it's going to be that number, 1.81 times 10 power 22, multiplied by the unit charge of an electron, that's 1.6 times 10, negative 19, right? So let's multiply that number. Okay, so let's say we've got the number multiplied by 1.6, exponent minus 19, uh, that, that gives me 2,898.52. So 2,898.52 electrons, uh, uh, sorry, that's coulombs, right? And now that we've got the charge, finally, ladies and gents, we can say, well, current is charge divided by the change in time. 
So that's 2,898.52 divided by the time, the change in time. They said this is 30 minutes. So they are, this must be in seconds. Um, so I'm going to say 30 multiplied by uh, 60. Right. So let's take that uh, number and we divide that by uh, 30 multiplied by 60. And so that gives us 1.61 amperes of current. All right. So that is truly how the cookie crumbles, ladies and gents. Every time we're looking for current, um, I think it's only in the IB where they give uh, Faraday's constant. Uh, in this case, uh, we could use that. It's much quicker. Uh, but nonetheless, because we are not given in DBE, I am going to stick to that method. Right, ladies and gents, and we come to the end of that question paper. I hope for those of you that were writing, uh, you are able to fully, fully understand that question paper. Please, I'll continue to give you more in terms of uh, maths and science as you prepare. Uh, some of you are preparing for the November exams. All right. Uh, some of you are preparing for your June exams. Um, we'll continue to give you some good content. Uh, otherwise, from me for now, uh, I'll see you guys next time. And please do not forget to subscribe and don't forget to hit that like button. And please, 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 uh, if you want our contact details and our center, all the details are on the description of this video. I'll see you guys next time. Shop, shop.